Intel needed a hero. After a decade unchallenged in the CPU market, a resurgent Ryzen had already got some strong hits in, and a self-inflicted PR disaster in the wake of Raptor Lake would leave Team Blue battered and bruised in 2024. A new socket, a new process node, even a new identity would help Intel shake off the last few years of bad results and make a fresh start, and nobody noticed. Almost a year later, it seems like every new build recommendation revolves around AMD. But is it too soon to count Intel out? The first most enthusiasts got to hear about the new tile-based Intel Arrow Lake generation was the Desktop 200 series, codenamed Arrow Lake, and what we heard was not encouraging. According to all the data at launch, the Ultra 9 285K was a step backwards in performance from the self-destructing i9s of the Raptor Lake generation and couldn't compete with AMD in gaming. However, that was a year ago. Since then, there have been BIOS updates, including the new 200S Boost overclocking profile, and high-speed CU DIMM memory has become more available. Perhaps now is the time to revisit the Ultra 9 and see if the changes have made it worth buying in 2025. As a reminder, the Core Ultra 9 285K, not the i9 285K, is a 24-core CPU with 24 threads. Intel's latest strategy is to drop hyperthreading, which I guess we can just call SMT now, and replace it by just throwing e-cores at you. This means the 285K still has 8 full bore performance cores, just like the i9s it replaces. However, these are now fabricated using the Intel 3 process, meaning for potentially lower power consumption. The P cores have a base frequency of 3.2 GHz and can boost up to 5.7 while the 16 efficient cores run at 3.2 GHz with the potential to boost up to 4.6. The P cores have access to a 36 MB pool of level 3 cache, while the E cores only have level 1 and 2. Alongside all these cores, Intel still found room for their integrated graphics processor, in this case the Arc XE LPG with 64 execution units running at 2 GHz. You may wonder why I mention it as Nobody really ever tests the iGPUs because everyone expects them to be crap, but Intel's iGPUs remain popular among video editors and those who use their PC to stream media across a network. The Intel QuickSync standard handles hardware encoding and decoding of pretty much every video format out there, including ones that full-size NVIDIA and AMD GPUs can't handle, or at least don't handle much better. This isn't quite Intel's cutting edge technology. The Arc 140T iGPU, found in the mobile version of the 285, has XMX cores, which can handle hardware XESS upscaling in games, but I think if you're buying a CPU like this for gaming, then you're probably going to be adding a proper graphics card as well. If you weren't, you really should. Another benefit to the 200 series platform, and currently only the 200 series platform, is access to CU DIMMs. These DDR5 memory modules have their own clock drivers on board, allowing for much higher frequencies with greater stability. The kit I have here is running at 8000 MTs out of the box, and could probably be overclocked even higher. Let me know if that's a video you'd be interested in seeing. The U9-285K, along with a matching Asus ROG Strix Z890 motherboard and 48GB of Corsair CU DIMMs were provided for this review by my favourite UK PC retailer, Scan Computers. This is not a paid review, I wasn't briefed on how to make Intel look better or anything of that nefarious nature, but as the hardware didn't cost me anything, I still ticked the SponCon box. They also provided the RTX 5090 that's making sure I don't hit a GPU bottleneck, and you'll definitely be seeing more of that in the future. Everything is powered by a Corsair HX1200 PSU, and the CPUs tested are all being cooled by an Arctic 280mm Freezer 3. Speaking of which, I'm comparing the U9-285K to some other CPUs I already have access to, and because I'm not hardware Nexus tech tips, that's not exactly going to be cutting edge stuff. 
The CPUs in the test lineup are as follows. The Ryzen 9 7900X 3D, with the same total thread count as the 285K, but with just 12 cores and multi-threading, plus AMD's signature 3D vCache on half of its cores. Next up is the Ryzen 7 7800X 3D, the former title holder of the best gaming CPU in the world, and still in the top 5 even now. And finally, the Ryzen 7 7700, one of my personal picks for those who need a productivity-focused CPU for a lower price. As the Ryzen's can't use the clock driver on the CU DIMM memory, I used my old faithful DDR5 6000 CL30 sticks tuned to build Zoid's timings. I also have a few baseline benchmark numbers from the i9-13900K, but if you saw last week's video, you'll understand why I don't have more of them. Starting out with Battlefield 6 in a 64 player conquest map running at 1080p low with DLSS quality. Which probably wasn't necessary, I'm sure it would have been CPU limited and native 1080p, but it doesn't hurt to be careful. The 285K does very well, churning out about 230 FPS on average, making it a decent pairing for a 240Hz display. Turning on boost mode lifts that average by only about 4%, which does make you wonder if it's actually worth applying. 200S Boost is an Intel approved one click overclock that doesn't affect your warranty, but like all overclocking, it's not guaranteed to work or to be 100% stable. Compared to the Ryzen's, however, even the boosted result isn't that impressive, falling between the 8 core 7700 and the 7900X3D running with just 6 cores. CS2 is a rough game to benchmark consistently. The built-in benchmark doesn't seem to reflect real-world CPU performance, so I prefer to play a real-world deathmatch in Dust 2 at 1080p low. This is absolutely wildly beneath the RTX 5090. The RX 7900 XT I've used in the past is functionally equal on pretty much any CPU I've ever tested in this game, but this is one of the rare occasions where everyone gets to see high frame rates regardless of the graphics card. The 285K puts in a solid competitive performance, averaging 326 FPS without boost and gaining just a couple of points with boost. However, it should be said that the Ryzen X3D chips in the 7000 series and even 5000 series outperform this by 10-20% and a pre-nerf 13th or 14th Gen i9 would have surpassed it by a small amount too. Onto something far more impressive. At 1080p very high with quality DLSS, The Last of Us Part 2 is, occasionally, borderline GPU limited. By an RTX 5090, the 285K averages 177 FPS in standard operation and gains 10 frames, about 6%, in boost mode. All my previous testing of this game was done with an RX 7900 XT in FSR performance and that clearly wasn't powerful enough, so again I went back and redid the benchmarks on the Ryzen's, but this time with the 5090. The 7800 X3D actually only draws level with the Ultra 9 here and the other chips all fall somewhat short of the mark. I double checked the results with DLSS cranked up to performance and the numbers were almost exactly the same, which should eliminate the possibility that this is a GPU bottleneck. Good job Intel! Continuing the run of impressive results, Spider-Man 2 blew my mind on the 285K. Honestly, my experiences with this game so far have been very much negative. It's a pretty poor quality port that I've never really had a genuinely smooth experience with. But this kit can actually do it, achieving 149 FPS at the very high preset. That climbs to 165 with boost mode enabled, a roughly 10% increase over the base results. Adding ultimate ray tracing does take a chunk out of the frame rate, averaging 99 FPS standard and 105 with boost. Retesting the Ryzen's and once again the 7800X 3D is beaten here. I know I shouldn't be too impressed, there is a 9800X 3D now after all, but still. Cyberpunk was the first real letdown among the AAA games. It's very much CPU limited at around the 100 FPS mark with or without ray tracing. Borderline unplayable, I know. 
In fact, I'd missed that I'd accidentally left the output resolution at 1440p, so I had to go back and redo them all at 1080p for pretty much exactly the same result, except GPU utilization dropped from 60% to 40%. The 7800X 3D has a roughly 10% lead, but from a value standpoint, you can get equally good results to the Intel from a Ryzen 7700. Perhaps even more disappointing is Space Marine 2. It sometimes feels a little churlish complaining that a game can't hit 100 FPS on a given CPU, because 100 FPS is a lot. However, in this case, pretty much none of them can. The 285K only just passes 80 FPS on average. Enabling boost gains an extra 8% or so, but pretty much any Ryzen AM5 chip is limited to around the 90 FPS mark. The only chip to break 100 FPS is the mighty 7800X 3D, which wins by about 50%. Oh dear. For some reason I couldn't get the Hitman World of Assassination benchmark to load up at all on any CPU. The game itself loads up fine, but the point is the benchmark is a massive CPU stress test with tons of physics effects and particles strewn around the place, whereas actual gameplay is generally far less stressful on a system. I installed the game especially for this benchmark and tried verifying the files and everything. Anyway, putting that disappointment aside, Oh no, wait, the Baldur's Gate 3 test is also disappointing, but for the other reason. At 130 to 139 FPS, depending on whether you're boosted or not, the 285K is putting in numbers on par with the Ryzen 7 7700. Admittedly, this is still radical overkill for a turn-based RPG, but again, the 7700 is a far less expensive CPU. You'll have noticed that there were two sets of results for the 7900X 3D, as most of the time that CPU benefits from having one CCD turned off when gaming, cutting it down from 12 cores to just 6. With that being said, I wondered if there was any benefit to disabling the E cores on the 285K. Well, in a word, no. I only tried a few games and never with much success. Cyberpunk lost about 7% at Ultra and over 15% at RT Ultra. The Last of Us wasn't as big a drop, but it was still a drop from the full experience, and Baldur's Gate was roughly on par with the 24-core test. Perhaps it would offer more headroom for overclocking, but in stock testing there doesn't seem to be any advantage to turning the E-cores off. Things are looking a lot more positive for the 285K in productivity. I put together a 5 minute 4K 60fps timeline in the basic version of DaVinci Resolve, which only uses GPU acceleration in certain specific tasks and still uses the CPU for exporting H.264 files. I threw in a few colour grades, some titles, some transparency and some fancy transitions to make things a bit more challenging, and the 285K exports it in just 3 minutes 18 seconds, or a whole 4 seconds faster with 200S boost. By comparison, even the fastest of the Ryzen's is almost a minute slower. Now, you might rightly point out that I'm unfairly comparing the 285K to a bunch of gaming-focused X3D chips from a couple of years ago, but looking at the results Puget Systems have had with some of the 9000 series, it's clear that this Intel chip is up there with the best AMD has to offer. Blender is another excellent use case for Intel, and rendering the classroom scene with CPU cycles takes just 2 minutes 12 seconds. I know this isn't saying much, like I said, I'm not Steve's tech tips, but this is the fastest result I've ever seen, beating a tuned Ryzen 7945HX 3D by more than 20 seconds and a 12th gen i9 by over a minute. Good news aside however, turning on boost does nothing. Well, not nothing, it actually slows it down by a tenth of a second. In synthetics, the 285K continues to do well. The Cinebench 24 multi-core score stands 50% clear of the 7900X 3D and more than double the 7800X 3D. Much of this is thanks to its single-threaded performance, as the single-core score is still 20% higher than the best of the Ryzen's. 
The gap is smaller in Geekbench 6, but still pronounced. There's about a 10% single core difference and about 20% in multi core compared to the 7900X 3D. Geekbench AI is frankly all over the shop. I don't pretend to understand the Ryzen results at all, but the 285K beats them all soundly anyway. What you don't see in any of these tests is a reason to use the boost mode. Sure, it doesn't cost anything, and there's no reason not to use it, but you might not have the option. One of the two sample CPUs acquired by Hardware Unboxed doesn't work with boost mode at all, and Intel have said that while using 200S boost won't void your warranty, there's no guarantee it'll even work. If you lose the silicon lottery and get a sample that can't use boost or isn't stable when it's enabled, then never mind, you're not missing much. Boost mode adds a maximum of 3.4% and can subtract as much as 1.8% from benchmarks. In gaming, boost can actually improve percentile loads quite a lot, and that could be a very worthwhile feature, except that for the most part, the 285K just isn't the best choice for a gaming CPU. And that leaves just one final thing to talk about, power consumption. Reading these gaming results and benchmarks would give the impression that the 285K is a strong contender, losing out to the Ryzen's in some areas while gaining in others, but that's ignoring one crucial bit of information. Remember the Cinebench score? 50% higher than the 7900X 3D? Well, that was achieved using a peak of 247 watts from the CPU. 247 watts! The 7900X 3D peaked at 120. That 50% performance gain cost over 100% more power. This is more efficient than the 13900K, which scored lower and used about 5 watts more in the process, but Intel is still miles behind AMD when it comes to performance per watt. And perhaps that doesn't mean much to you. Perhaps you have solar panels and a big ass lithium battery power in your house. Perhaps your government heavily subsidizes your local energy industry, or you have a fixed rate energy bill, or your parents pay the bills. Good for you, but to everyone else, this means the cost of the 285K is even higher than it first appears. This brutally fast, gas-guzzling CPU from an American institution, now almost literally, is essentially the CPU equivalent of a Hummer. Thanks again to Scan for providing the review samples. If you're a UK viewer, I've included links to everything featured in this video in the description. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.